Welcome to the Feminist Ethical Dialogues. My name is Kathleen Richardson, founder of the Campaign Against Porn Robots. It's my great pleasure to welcome Stella Perrett, who is an artist and political cartoonist, who will be discussing today and telling us about uh, representations of women in uh, science fiction. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you, Stella. Oh, thank you, Kathleen, and uh, thanks very much for having me at CASR, and I, I'm really, um, really looking forward to, um, to this. Um, so I'm very interested in your campaign, and until I was sort of um, catapulted in, into the radical feminist world, I, I knew very little about the whole concept of trans, trans this, trans that, transhumanism. And then I realized that my, my 40 years of experience as a science fiction illustrator and somebody who's fascinated by science fiction um, has given me a sort of um, background, a, a way of viewing what's actually, what was actually happening that seems very confusing uh, to a lot of us. Um, and here's my first slide. I'm, I'm deliberately using the word groomed. Um, it may not be deliberate grooming. A lot of people are gonna say, oh, well, all science fiction is doing is reflecting society as it is, or is reflecting what its audience wants. Uh, but I think if you look at it overall, you can see a definite pattern of how women have been represented. Uh, so let's go on to the first, next slide. Um, this is about my background in science fiction fandom. Um, I've been involved in science fiction clubs. Um, uh, science fiction fandom involves going to um, conferences uh, and meeting meeting authors and um, be, being part of the whole fan fandom scene. Uh, I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, so this is way before the internet. Uh, in fact, before mobile phones, a lot of it. So we used to physically go to these uh, conferences and, and meet up uh, all over the country and um, met some quite well-known British science fiction authors of the time. Um, this is an example of the kind of science fiction illustration I was doing at the time, um, which is a, a magazine called the British Review of Science Fiction, which was quite well known. Um, what, I, what I'm hoping is that people will be able to um, go back through this. Oh. And, and use them um, as, as you please. So um, that just explains a bit of my background in, in science fiction fandom. So can we go on to the next slide? And again, some examples of um, the kind of science fiction magazines I was illustrating back in the day. Um, the one on the right is an author that I'm <clears throat> still working with who does um, uh, fantasy and science fiction for teen teenagers. Uh, the other, the other two, the one in the middle was a science fiction fan fan magazine, a fan club magazine, and the one on the left is science fiction poetry. So this is the sort of thing I've been doing. Uh, look how long ago that was, 1988. And um, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, some of you may know me from. Um, I was quite notoriously cancelled from the Morning Star in February last year. Um, I knew very little about the radical feminist world when it happened to me, and I've had I've been on a steep learning curve. I've made many many friends, uh, especially on Spinster and through. Could we go back? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> um, and I had never done cartoons on this subject before this happened to me, really, uh, and obviously it inspired me to do more. Uh, people started asking me to do more. So um, the one on the left you see there is um, about the erasure of gay and lesbians, uh, you know, uh, through the sort of transing of children. The one on the right um, is one that appeared on Jennifer Billick's um, website, the 11th hour blog. And that is about a, um, a doctor in, in Central Europe, I can't remember the country he's in, something like Slovakia, who actually genuinely wants to set up a European central body part bank <laughs> for transgenderism. Um, so that was a cartoon about that. Um, and those are a couple of the websites I've regularly contributed to, womenarehuman.com, 
and on commongroundmedia.com. So you can see my work on those websites. Um, yes, if you'd like to go on. Um, comics, yes, I think with the internet, the two generations we've had that have grown up with nothing but the internet probably don't realize how important comics were to, to children and teenagers, you know, growing, you know, going back 40, 30, 40 years. That was all we really had. There was no internet. Um, going to the cinema, if you didn't have much money, you didn't have much in the way of pocket money, you, you couldn't really go to the cinema unless your parents took you. So comics were actually what you, you had for recreation. Um, and, I, and I'm saying here that if you, you may not realize how it dominated children's popular culture. Now, obviously there were a lot of girls comics which were all about fashion and pop stars and so on. The science fiction fantasy comic genre was essentially for boys. Um, it, it was dominated by boys. Uh, the industry itself, the artists, the writers, the publishers, it was, all, it was a male dominated industry. And the, these comics, we're talking about um, the pulp comic era was from the early 1940s. There literally were, there were, hard, there were no women involved in it in those days, you know. It, so it naturally reflected the, the sexist prejudices of the time. Um, men were always the, the sort of heroes, you know, space cowboys. Women were always sort of um, just there really to sort of scream at the monsters and be rescued and... And this is an example of one of these kind of comics. That is the nearest a young lad could get in those days to seeing soft porn. You know, he wouldn't have been able to go into the newsagent and buy the top shelf magazines himself. Um, so this, this kind of comic was where he was literally going to see unclothed women, <laughs> women being um, maybe turned into cyborgs or experimented on. Uh, this is the sort of thing that was in these comics. Um, and as I'm saying here, generations of boys grew up with these depictions of women in the comics. So in the same way that they are kind of influenced by depictions of women online in porn today, in those days, it was in, in comics. Um, and comics could actually get away with showing the female body more explicitly than they can in a movie, which has got lots of uh, censorship. You know, so yeah, that's a good example. Do you want to go on to the next slide, please? And here's some more examples. There's some of these comics I've got in my own collection. Um, and so, you know, I've literally just, here we are, photographs of the covers, really. And I, as you can see, here are women just literally helpless. Um, they're, they're, it, there are the men are, are dressed like, you know, they're dressed, he's dressed for the jungle there, but the girl is in. You know, she's in a, a sort of dress that she might be going out to, uh, I don't know, dancing in, you know. She's certainly not dressed for the jungle, is she? So there are women just there to be rescued from killer robots and uh, other sort of predatory aliens. Um, I'm, I've also mentioned there about Doctor Who. It was a, it was a big criticism leveled at Doctor Who, which actually started in, in 1963, I believe that the girls in Doctor Who were only there as eye candy. They didn't have any important role. They were just there to be rescued. And it's 54 years since the first episode of Doctor Who that they finally had a female Doctor Who. And, and the female Doctor Who was, uh, yeah, there was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of um, uh, controversy about it. The male fans of Doctor Who didn't want it, didn't want it at all, you know. So that's just three more examples. If we can go on. Um, and people are immediately going to say, oh, well, there is one female character in comics, you know, and that's Wonder Woman. And, I, and I've said here, maybe the one exception to the objectifying of women. But as you can see from these covers and, and the movie poster, um, she's still highly sexualized. She, yeah, she might be, yeah, oh, isn't it great to see a, a female superhero, you know, but what's you know what's what's different really she's still a very objectified very sexualized um character um and in, even the, the 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 new film is the same you know nothing has really changed if we can go on and so 
this is my um, view of what science fiction has been doing. It, it's been preparing us, if you like, for the hundred years that we've had science fiction films and um, comics and, and TV, TV um, to accept the cyborgization or robotization of society, the AI that we've got now, it's it's been uh, kind of preparing us for it, kind of grooming us for it, to accept it all as natural and normal. Um, and I, I've made a distinction here. I'm saying that the, when, when robots in science fiction are shown as male or child personas, they are, they are very different to the female ones. Um, so you could say that data in Star Trek is meant to be a male. Um, you could say um, there's, there's a lovely film called Robot and Frank, which came out in 2012, where the little robot is a companion robot. Um, so the, the, the robots that are kind of male or kind of almost like pets are shown as companions. They're shown as unthreatening, loyal, helpful, um, saving the day sometimes. Uh, there are numerous films showing teenage robots and, and robots which, and which will appeal to children. And I've given two examples, Bumblebee and Chappie. Chappie in particular is very, um, I'm trying to think of a, a good word to describe Chappie. It's, it's even, it even includes, uh, as the actors, a, a quite a well-known South African rap group. So it was, it was clearly aimed at teenagers. Uh, and Chappie is trying to normalize things like downloading um, human consciousness into a robot body. Um, it, it shows a, a, a young lady, a young woman who thinks of Chappie as her child. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very, all trying, all normalizing the whole idea of, of um, birth and gestation and um, raising children as robots. Um, and I've said I, I didn't think this was very uh, surprising that, you know, that the people who manufacture robots, mostly men, or were mostly men, um, when men create any kind of gadget or um, any any kind of um, manufactured thing that they can use, they do tend to give them personalities. Um, going all the way back to the uh, the GIs and the um, airplanes in the in the World War in World War Two, they they would um, have um, cartoons of nearly naked women on on the front of their airplanes, and give them really extraordinarily graphic graphic sexual names. Uh, so we, we go back, at, men do go back a long way with this. Um, they, they, they do give the, the things they manufacture personalities. Um, all the films are aimed at showing us that this will never get too dangerous. It will never get too out of control, uh, that humans are always gonna be able to control AI. Um, and I'm giving some examples of films that, that show that as a theme. Westworld, Terminator, Robocop, all these films show an initial danger where it all seems to be getting out of control, but then, you know, some heroic human is able to um, fight back and, uh, yeah, put the AI back in its box, essentially. So if you'd like, if we'd like to go on. And one person who really warned us about this, and I think we should pay heed to what he said, was Stephen Hawking, the British uh, uh, mathematical genius. He, uh, he died in 2018. One of the last things he said was that he thought AI was gonna be, it could be the worst thing that has ever happened. It could be the last thing that ever happens to humanity. Um, people who are in, into science fiction and uh, looking into what, what could happen in the future of AI, um, they call the stage where robots become sentient the singularity. And uh, they say that when we hit the singularity, it will develop so so fast that we will have we will not be able to control it, and it will um, 
it will come to the point where it it will not, it will just see human beings as either in the way or, or either just useful um just helping it to develop further or or just in the way um a very famous example in, in science fiction films is the how 9000 computer in 2001 the space odyssey which is so advanced that it develops um paranoia and um it, it, you know, it, it thinks the humans are plotting against it and it retaliates and essentially wipes them out. That's a very good example. And that was way back in 1968. So um, people who've been writing science fiction, um, the makers of science fiction films, um, yes, this, this sort of thing has been forecast for a long time. But yes, Stephen Hawking, so he, he, talking, he, he warned us against what could happen. Uh, and I think his warning was very important. So if we could go on. And here we have another man who is, um, he is um, at the forefront of transhumanism, uh, at the forefront of robotizing human beings. Uh, so what I've said here is um, <coughs> every prosthetic humans have ever invented could be seen as the beginning of robotization. You know, even spectacles and false teeth. And, and some of these things we've been probably thinking about and, and starting to make, going back to medieval times, maybe going back into, even into prehistory, people might have had things like false teeth made of wood, who knows? But humans have been trying to augment themselves, trying to overcome disabilities with artificial means for a long, long time. Um, now, everything that we see being developed today is being sold to us as benign. It's being sold to us as, uh, a cure for illnesses. Um, uh, I'll give, give some examples. Um, soldiers coming back from wars, artificial legs, the Paralympians running on their artificial legs, um, implants to let the blind see again, to let the deaf hear again. Uh, this is all being, you know, this is all supposed to be so wonderful. Um, Elon Musk has invented a brain phone and I think a few other companies are right close behind him. They're all, they're all trying to develop this. Um, what I'd like to say about this is that he's 50 years old um, and he wasn't even born when the next uh, slide we're gonna see, uh, you know, if you could go on. Oh, okay. Well, I, okay, well, I'm sorry. I, I, I made a bit of a mistake there, but no, this leads on from it as well. Oh. And we can go back after that. Yes, yeah, so this is Joe 90. This was 1968. Joe 90 is the original um, brain phone child. Uh, he, uh, and I've said here, Jerry Anderson, um, it was a TV series, it was also comics. It, it also came out as, as these annuals. This is, this is one in my own collection. This guy has had everything that the modern transhumanists wanted, a compliant prepubescent boy, he was told he would be this amazing super spy. Um, he didn't seem to have a father on the scene. He, he, you know, he was adopted by this uh, scientist who worked for the United Nations, and he was sent to all trouble spots all over the world as a sort of mini mercenary. Um, absolutely incredible. And this was two years before Elon Musk was born. Joe Knightley would be put into that machine that you see there, and it would spin round and round, and it would kind of inject into his brain the knowledge of, of whatever um, whatever the specialist knowledge needed to be for the, for the trouble spot in the world he was going to go and sort everything out you know <laughs> absolutely extraordinary um, I, and I've said there that the multi-millionaires who are funding today's transhumanism were boys who grew up on this diet of this kind of tv shows comics and movies so if we could just go back one yeah, these are, these are some other um, teen and child robot TV series, comics and so on. Um, <laughs> Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles, they put on a kind of exoskeleton to become superheroes. And I've just said there, you know, Elon Musk's brain phone or somebody else's brain phone will be the must-have teenage gadget within five years. There is no question that at all. This walking along the road, looking at looking down at something in your hand is going to be yesterday's thing, you know. What's the point of doing that when you can have it implanted directly into the brain 
and talk to your friends on the other side of the world just by thinking about it. This is coming. If you're worried as a parent now about your kids being given things in school, you know, schools doing things behind your back, wait until they all want something implanted in their brains and they can literally go down to a shop and queue up and have it done. Um, here's some examples of TV shows, again, going back a long way to the 1980s, the 1960s. Um, Teenage Robot, that was quite a, a well-known American TV series. Small Wonder, again, in the 1980s, about a, a kind of apple pie American family who, with a child robot living next door who looked just like a, a human being. You can see how long how long this has been going on and how normal it seems. Um, if we could go on a couple of slides. Yeah, um, so I, the reason I'm referring back to these slides, I'm referring back a little bit, I um, hope you don't mind. It's so that, um, to remind you obviously what we've already mentioned, but it also I hope people will be able to use these slides in isolation if they want. Um, so as I've said here, if prosthetics are an acceptable face of cyber organization because they are to help the afflicted, there's only one step to a prosthetic which improves on the whole of your existing body. Um, and there are various um, things that have been thought of to do with this, um, including, um, you know, where, where they, they freeze you after death, you know, and they just keep the head in these, in these tanks in the hope that it, sometime in the future, people are going to invent a maybe a robot body, who knows, then they can kind of graft your existing head onto it. So the idea of um, an exoskeleton uh, is really quite, quite, quite uh, old. Um, and I've said here about the, the whole history of superhero comics is it, very uh, young, male, um, quite weedy, weedy boys, for the most part. They put on the superhero costume, and you know they become this amazing um, person who can uh, get all the girls. You know everybody looks up to them. They're fighting crime. And they're putting the world to rights. Um, so I've mentioned a couple there: Clark Kent, Superman, Peter Parker, Spider Man, Matt Murdock, Daredevil. They were all young. They were all shown as um, <clears throat> young, sort of nerds uh, with uh, physical things wrong with them, or socially inept. Uh, Matt Murdock actually had depression. Um, Peter Parker, he was uh, couldn't get a girlfriend. Um, you know, so that that's the sort of pattern. Then they, they put on the superhero costume and suddenly they're this, this amazing, uh, you know, the whole world looks up to them. Um, and Iron Man, Tony Stark Iron Man is probably the most um, blatant of these because Tony Stark has a heart condition. And when he puts on his uh, Iron Man costume, it cures the heart condition. So, you know, that's a very uh, good example of, of that Iron Man. So if you want, want to go on. Um, again, I'm referring back to the point I made before that, that if a robot or a cyborg is shown as a male or a child or perhaps an animal, um, they're, they're shown very differently to how women are shown. Um, so I've listed um, what I think are the attributes that male and, and child robots have. You know, they're shown as friendly, they're shown as brave, they have cutesy little names, they're shown as loyal companions, almost human, and mostly the good guys. Um, this is a, an example, which is Bumblebee, um, a loyal companion robot, which were based on the toys called Transformers, which were very popular, still are popular. Um, it, I can't stress enough how all this is, is normalizing children and teenagers uh, to the idea that society, the society that is coming, the world they're in now, that they're growing up in, will be heavily robotized. Um, and it and it and even the ideas that we used to think in science fiction weren't really far out, you know, really unusual, like downloading consciousness into a computer and so on. That's actually seen as, a, as quite old hat now, you know. It's um it's such a normal idea now in science fiction that uh, 
<laughs> nobody's going to be surprised if, when people manage to do it in real life, are they? Um, so the next couple of slides are how women are, are shown um, in a, in a non-human way in science fiction. So if we could carry on. So this was the very earliest film that people think of as a, a, class, a classic science fiction film on the big screen, which was 1927, Metropolis by Fritz Lang. All the things that could have been shown on the movie poster, you know, a super advanced city or, uh, you know, uh, different gadgets or different things that they'd invented. No, they showed a sexualized female robot on the front cover. Probably one of the most famous images in science fiction. <clears throat> um, yeah, so if we could go on. Um, that's, that's actually one of my own illustrations um, of Ripley and the alien. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit about this one. Um, so women, when they're not being shown as robots, they're being shown as monstrosities. And <laughs> I, aliens, I am convinced, absolutely convinced, that the popularity of the alien monster the alien films is to do with the fact that she is female. Um, she is the ultimate female monster. Um, and I said there that she epitomizes everything men find repulsive about women's biology. Um, the, you know, the mystery of her reproductive process, you know, it, it shows in graphic close up the eggs being laid, you know, all the horrible gloop everywhere. You know, it, it's quite funny to talk about. Um, and the, the, you know, she, as a mother, she is a mother and she, the alien does nothing but try to defend her eggs, her babies. Uh, and Ripley, um, played by um, Sigourney Weaver there, um, it's quite famous that she was taking what is um, like a normal male role of the space cowboy, but actually she only does in the film what any man does, you know, and she's, uh, you know, she's leading the, uh, the battle against this, this female alien. Um, just want to make a point here <clears throat> that um, Jermaine Greer was forecasting the separation of women from their biology and back in 1999 in her book, um, The Whole Women, The Whole Woman. And I just want to quote from, a short quote from there. Um, she said, if state-of-the-art gesta gestational cabinets, which we would now call an artificial womb, could manufacture children and virtual female fetishes, which you might call sex robots or holographs or brain implants, could furnish sexual services, men would not regret the passing of real, smelly, bloody, noisy, hairy women. I thought that is Jermaine Grail, what a wonderful quote from 1999. Um, and to me, the alien monster, she is the epitome of what men, everything men dislike about women, <laughs> made into this, uh, this extraordinary um, alien creature. So if we'd like to go on. Um, then we've got some examples of um, quite sexualized dominatrix type uh, women in science fiction. Um, Tina Turner is a, a, a very well-known example in the Mad Max films. If we could go on. Women as non-human. Um, again, here's a typical film poster of a completely helpless female persona being carried by a man. Solaris, this is another famous Russian film. Um, the backstory was that the, the astronaut's wife committed suicide. Nobody ever found out why, but um, well, could be something to do with him, I suppose. But she's uh, she was revived as an alien life form, which gradually, which sort of struggled to become more human in the way that Data in Star Trek struggles to become human. Uh, so again, you know, it's the theme of women as being not human um, is is in, carried on in this. So if we can go on, um, I'm just doing a shout out to Jennifer Billick and her background research into the money trail of transhumanism and transgender. Um, the 11th Hour blog, I highly recommend everybody to, to read it. Uh, 
I think she's been investigating this for about what six, seven years now. So do have a look at that if you have if you have time to. You can go on. Right. So thinking back to the Metropolis uh, film poster in, from 1927, <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, some people might say, well, that was just like a robot. It wasn't particularly sexualized. It, although why has it got? Why did it have the pointy breasts on the front? Well, but filmmakers realized what they could do with the idea of a female robot. And I said here is, was this the first big screen sex bot movie? This is from 1949, a British film, heavily class ridden. Uh, it, it, it was about a, a guy and his, his butler, his valet. So there, there you see, I mean, only rich men had, had butlers. And they were out, out for a night on the town. And this, this female robot had been created as an escort, literally, designed for tired businessmen it, it was in the uh, was in the blurb for the poster and uh, you couldn't have anything more blatant than this um, <laughs> there's a sex bot and again you see how far back this sort of idea has has been going on in films if you want to go on to the next one um, I've called this film the most disingenuous of the sex bot films and I, I'd like to explain what I mean by that this film, it, I'm going to read this out. This film implied that the only people who will be able to indulge themselves in this fetish will be eccentric multimillionaires living in luxury in the middle of nowhere with a harem of sex slaves. An ordinary man, and the example was Caleb, who was a computer geek, what a surprise, who was sucked into this, ma this rich man's world, is allegedly going to be mortified and find it morally repugnant and, and try and help the sex bots in their, their fight back and their escape. Um, <laughs> but in reality, it's not going to happen like that. They're not going to be eccentric millionaires. This is going to be something that is going to be imposed on the whole of society. Um, sorry, I've just repeat, I've just read out that, um, that, that quote from Jermaine Greer there. So Ex Machina, a very clever film, a very, um, uh, very exotic, very uh, very well made, but completely uh, gaslighting us into the idea that ordinary men will find this repugnant. Ordinary men would would immediately would go in there and and gosh, they try and help the sex bots uh, to, to kind of retaliate, you know. So let's go on to the next one. Um, <laughs> here's some um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fembots, these were called, and these were from the Austin Power films, which were James Bond spoof films. Um, they were clearly ridiculous. Uh, they, they had uh, all kinds of little um, weapons and things in the belts there that they could use. Uh, you know, just clearly, um, clearly sex bots. And that was from 1997 to 2002, those films. If you want to go on. Another sex bot. This was called Pris, and this was from the, from the Blade Runner films, um, remade in 2017. The hero falls in love with the robot, the female robot, what a surprise, um, and they take on the bad guys together. Uh, Blade Runner was, was a massively influential film. Uh, it was made into games, computer games, TV series. Uh, other films were kind of spawned off it. It's, it's actually in the Library of Con Congress, uh, National Film Registry as a culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant film. That's how important Blade Runner was considered to be. Um, yeah, and absolutely typical sex bot that the hero falls in love with, yeah. So let's go on to the next slide. This is one of my favorites in this genre, and this is a British film, a British American film. Again, Gaslighting is into the idea that this is only ever going to be about mad scientists in the middle of nowhere. It's only ever going to be um, people going off off pissed at pissed and doing this off their own bat. And uh, when when anybody normal um, stumbles across the setup, we, you know they're going to they're going to uh, help to uh, dismantle it. And so the the story of Morgan is that um, this genetically modified human is grown in a laboratory. And they have a backstory of loads and loads of disasters in the same way that cloned, the cloned sheep, the cloned animals have loads of disasters. 
until you get a successful one. So, it was, um, so this transhuman that's been grown in this laboratory is so dangerous that it's kept in a sort of vault underground. And the um, and I've said the film is notable for the Toby Jones, who plays the ma the lead scientist, who refers to this creature all the way through as his baby. Um, so when when this creature predictably is let out by somebody who feels sorry for it and, and it runs amok, they send another female cyborg to seek and destroy it. So it becomes a classic um, the cowboy film in the end. Um, and as I've said here, as with the other films, Ex Machina, Terminator, Robocop, Chappie, we're being groomed to believe that if our sentient AI monstrosities go on the rampage, we will be able to safely put it, put them back in the box. And I said Stephen Hawking questioned this reasoning, and I think we should do well to pay attention to it. But these are examples of, of how films are hammering this idea home that Oh, it might always be or be a bit scary and dangerous at the beginning, but you know, we will be able to control it easily, you know. And it's always females, there's always female personas that are shown in, in this as dangerous and out of control and highly sexualized. So let's go on to another one. Um, as, as I've said, we, we we haven't explored science fiction literature, that would be a thing all on its own, and it, you know, whole whole university courses are probably um you know, you, you, uh, it, it, it are, are on the subject. Um, but there are plenty of authors who've pushed the boundaries in imagining the role of women in future societies. And we do have some feminist science fiction authors who are quite well known, Joanna Rush, Sherry S. Pepper. Um, I've mentioned a couple of authors there and their books where they're imagining how women will be treated, uh, maybe, in human societies that might become like bees, where you just have a few women just kept as sort of uh, to lay the eggs and so on. And just to show you how up to date this is and how it's being accepted um, by in highbrow literature, um, here's a book that was uh, long listed for the Booker Prize this year by Kazuo Ishiguro. Uh, it's called Clara and the Sun. And what's it about? It's about a female companion robot who is struggling to become more human. I mean, this theme just is never ending. So if we could go on to the next slide. And I'm gonna, I'm coming to the end of this presentation by having a look at a, a film from 2015. And this, this has been a very brief overview of this subject. Uh, it's based on my own knowledge. It's based on my own experience as, as a science fiction illustrator. Somebody else could have picked completely different films, books, or TV series and made a, a different argument. I'm absolutely sure. You know, I'm not trying to pretend that um, my, what I'm saying is, is the last word on this subject. I'm just trying to give an overview. Um, and I'm saying it, it's been a bit of doom and gloom so far. And I wanted to finish on this film because it's so hopeful and optimistic. And so different to all the others that I've been, we've been looking at. Uh, it broke the mold. It had a huge amount of abuse from male science fiction film fans because it had a female lead, uh, Charlize Theron there. It had lots of women, very strong women, actors and characters all the way through it. Uh, it was also very well received by disability organizations on both sides of the Atlantic for its um, portrayal of disabled uh, actors, real, actors with real disabilities, as well as actors uh, with prosthetics. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic world, apocalyptic world, so there's lots of people um, with terrible injuries, terrible deformations. So it's quite natural that they had to show a lot of uh, people with deformities, but, it, but it's shown as part of the natural landscape of the film. It's not drawn attention to. In fact, Charlize Theron, I hope I said her, pronounced her name correctly there, um, is shown as practically beating Mad Max to death with her disabled arm, <laughs> without the prosthetic one. So, uh, yeah, it's a very strong, very feminist film. If you think, oh, Mad Max, how hideous, and, and you can't bear the idea of watching it, I, I would like to um, disabuse you of that. Do please watch this film. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so, as I've said there, to show strong women and 
disabled and older actors, it, it can be done if, if people want to badly enough, you know. We, we can break out of the stereotyping. Um, if you'd like to go on. Um, this is just uh, my own advert here. Um, just quickly, um, you can see my website, radicalcartoons.com. I've got a page on there um, documenting some of my 40 years, actually, of science fiction and horror and fantasy illustration. Um, and I produced a book about the pandemic year, which um, you, can, you can still buy through Amazon. And um, anybody can commission me if they would like to get in touch. Uh, for cartoons or illustrations, any kind of designs, you're very welcome to get in touch with me. If you'd like to go on, Kathy. And this is just a, you know, this is just a, um, to say where the images came from. They're all public domain, as far as I'm aware, unless it was my own artwork or photographs of comics that are in my own collection. And um, obviously they, they are under the copyright of the original creators. Uh, my own illustrations are public domain, and so anything on my website you are welcome to use and copy, as long as you credit me as the artist. Right, I hope you've enjoyed that. It whizzed through 100 years of uh, science fiction, women being depicted in science fiction, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you ever so much, uh, Stella. Let me just stop sharing for a minute. That was amazing. Uh, it was so rich, it had so many interesting themes. I think um, I really agree with so much that you said as well. Uh, I was taken um, by your concept of grooming. Um, before I ask you about that, hmm. uh, what's interesting is the robot was a character in a play, right? It was... Hmm. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I, I would say no one's ever created a robot but that's a, another conversation for another time but yes, it was a character in a play they have and yet. Rossum's Universal Robots and the robots were assembled on a production line yeah. and um, you know they had the formula that animated them they were made of flesh and blood and the early depictions of them were very human-like they were just yes. like um, you know the root of the root of the term robot is from robota, which means to work slavishly. It's this idea of being a slave. Um, now, what was really interesting is that in the 1920s, when that play was produced, the culture was so obsessed with this idea of machines and mm. you know this ushering in this future that other artists took the idea of the robot and they turned it into a machine. It's in yeah. my first book, this history. And, um, and actually, by the end of the 1920s, the th mid 30s, Carol Chapak said, I don't want anything to do with my creation. It was almost like he rejected his creation because of how it was uh, abused and manipulated but by other right, artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm I mean, sure it'd be obviously famously Isaac Asimov, who, who kind of took it over and um, created the rules, the rules of robotics, where robots aren't allowed to harm a human or by negation cause a human to be harmed. And that has been used all the way through to ever since in Star Trek and everything. Yeah. Um, well, and I, as you were saying, yeah, they were originally, uh, it was kind of slave subspecies. Um, again, there are films I didn't mention in my presentation, which I, I could have mentioned, like Elysium, you know, uh, where they are shown as sort of slave slaves um yeah there's just so, so many oh area well um, area nine but but the point yeah. i'm i guess i'm trying to make that um these pornographic ideas the way that mm. the robot became represented yeah was a, was something actually that its original creator never mm. intended sure. he wanted to use robots and there were male and female robots in his mm. play as a way to comment on being yeah. human right yeah. he didn't sexualize yeah. the females no. in his plays no, it was right. other artists that did this yeah uh yeah. so but, he, but you can't you could he he wouldn't have any claim to have invented the idea because at that time um leading up to the first world war i mean it was becoming more and more everything was becoming more mechanized anyway I mean, and they were looking forward to the days where they could have um ro robot bombers and in fact they ended up with that in the second world war the v2s and so on so um you know 
I mean, the whole of society was moving in that direction anyway, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I think um, that one thing struck me about how, from your presentation, was how pornographic mm. the, these representations of women are. How, Definitely. and it's almost like the writers can't see women as human beings at all. That's why I, I, I wanted to contrast the way male persona robots like Data and Star Trek um, and sort of cutesy sort of um, companion robots. I think mm. I mentioned Doctor Who's little robot dog, K9. You know, you get all these cutesy robots in, in the te films which are for children to make them seem harmless and just, um, you know, and yet as soon as a, it, it's a female robot, it, it's completely different, completely different. You know, it's, it's either a horrible monster to be fought against, you know, or the woman is just there as I can be, or if it's an a robot cyborg persona, it's also highly sexualized. There is no, there is, there is no middle ground, is there? It's a, it, the, the personas are so different. Um, and I tried to show that in what is really quite a short presentation. Somebody could take what my ideas here and expand on on any any of the slides and 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 make a. You know, a, a bigger case for it, um, which anybody is welcome to do. I, I, I've thrown this out there from my own experience as an artist with a great interest in the subject. But I have to say that it wasn't until I had the experience of being cancelled um, that I that, that I started finding out about transhumanism and transgenderism, and that. So I've only been involved in this world for less than two years. Yeah, uh, and and then I, I I realized that I could tie it into what I've been seeing in science fiction all my life. Well, um, that, that's really important. So let's talk about your main thesis in that presentation, which is actually this cultural phenomena, science fiction, has been grooming us. Yeah. And you talk, you use the term denaturing. So perhaps you could explain that a bit more because I thought that was really important. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, the whole drive of transhumanism is towards a world where women are no longer responsible for um, birth, gestation, and raising children, or, or are only a peripheral part of it. Um, and so, all these films and, and the comics—they've all—they've all shown different aspects of this. Uh, as soon as you turn a woman into a robot, you you imply that. The, the, the actual who's who's giving birth to the humans uh you know how a human baby is going to be um created is it all going to be just robot babies um are a few humans going to be kept around to provide sperm and eggs and it all just gets gestated in laboratories um uh, there's a there's a most uh, i'm thinking of a recent film that is actually um one of my favorites i'm just uh, i've got it behind me on a stack of films here um Gosh, it's terrible when think the names of films go out of your head. I've, I've oh, yeah. films in my it happens to me all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Interstellar. Interstellar. Lovely, film, lovely yeah. film, beautiful music, very well acted, wonderful actors in it. A great theme that the earth is dying and, yeah, you know, we've got to go out and... Um, and that shows all the the human you know the eggs the, the human eggs that have been stored in deep freeze being taken out into space in a in a sort of laboratory in within the spaceship so that when they get to a planet they can uh, you know they can just kind of hatch them all out and it, it, it begs the question of hatch them all out in what you know are they going to be implanted back into uh, female actual human beings or or is it somehow going to be done in artificial wounds um so i don't think science fiction really answers that more in the literature they try to answer that than in films and comics but you can yeah. see the thrust of transhumanism all the way through so there's you, a deep aim, there's like aim a melders with with robots yeah so this is not accidental i mean misogyny no. runs through it misogyny yeah. is like the centerpiece of transhumanism right it is it's yeah. it's uh yeah, it about is. eradicating the female sex would you say I that Yes, and I don't, and I'm not saying it's just because it's misogynistic. It's because the idea that human beings can only survive by leaving this planet and moving out into space, which is fundamental to the 
sort of a worldview that a lot of people have got today, that the earth is doomed and, you know, how are we going to live here? It's large parts of it are going to become uninhabitable. <laughs> and some people believe that's going to happen in their lifetimes, God forbid, and, and they don't even want to have children because of it. Mm. So we, we already live within this mindset. Um, and so the idea that we've got to move out into space, what are you going to do? You can't take everybody with you. You know, and so who's going to do all the heavy lifting? Elon Musk is planning to build his own um, city on the moon. Um, he already put out a public statement about two weeks before the American election last November. He put out a statement saying that when he has his moon colony, it will not run on any laws that are made on Earth. They will make their own laws. And of course, you wouldn't want laws that, for example, prohibited slavery. You wouldn't want laws that were for health and safety or women's equality because you want to basically... Well, they, they already do that now. If they want to indeed. test a product or a service or a practice, yeah. they go to a country with less rule of law, less uh, commitment to women's rights. Yeah. They, they did it with yeah. the robot Sophia, for example. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And um, who knows what the Soviets used to get up to from the, the Baikonur um, rocket base? You know, you, we just don't know. It's behind the Iron Curtain at the time. Who knows? But, you know, they're going to need somebody to do the heavy lifting. And that somebody, um, because we have laws against slavery, um, mm. could be could be all mechanized. But it's just as likely that they're, they're going to want a sort of um, a sort of slave species of humans that are... Yeah. That I'm are actually not, that are not sexualized, that are not going to have messy diseases, that are not going to um, want to have sex or have babies and all that because, you know, that, that's not what they're there for. They'll, they'll be there to be laborers, basically. Um, and they don't need to live very long because there'll be an endless supply. So I'm sorry, but I, I see the whole movement. This is the way it's going. Yes, it's, it's very. Going. It's uh, the destruction of the planet, destruction of ties between people, uh, destruction of the female sex, destruction of empathy. On, I'm just putting a light on. Okay. It seems we've got a bit dim in here. I don't know if you can see me all right. Yes, I can, I can see you okay. But um, okay, so you talked about this grooming aspect, which yeah. I thought was really interesting. Now, you were someone immersed in this um, fiction, this literature and this, mm. uh, this cultural phenomena. Why didn't it groom you or did it groom you, but you actually stopped at some point along the way and said, hang on a minute. So tell I us think, about your story. I think it's, you're not groomed, right? You're not yeah, because buying I'm it. Based, um, because I'm not a man. Right. So I, didn't okay. the, I didn't see the sexualized. That's the first difference. Yeah. I didn't see the sexualized versions of women as something that I, I enjoyed seeing. I, I didn't like them. I mean, as of, even from being a girl, I didn't like anything like that. Even, even the paintings of Pablo Picasso I hated because of the disjointed women in his paintings, even though he was supposed to be a genius. So, you know, I've, I have not grown up thinking that that's wonderful or thinking it was normal, you know, and I, and I have sought out the kind of writers and films that I preferred that, that showed a different um, aspect of women in science fiction, which uh, I, I ended up on Mad Max Fury Road, which I think is a a good example and it, it stands out because it's so unusual you know it stands out uh it, it, like a beacon because all the others are so relentlessly misogynistic you know how do you think they've got away That's with it for so long because so everything you're saying is because it's only <laughs> <laughs> because it's been mainly a male audience a teenage mm -hmm. male audience it's not been an audience that cared too much about it or wanted to protest about it. Um, if you could, if you talk to a hundred women at random, you you might get two or three that have got an interest in science fiction, or or, or have read it or, or watched it or got a background in it. And, and even then, it might just be that their boyfriend has dragged them to the latest superhero film on a night out. You know, they haven't really got a. Do you know what I mean? They might say, "Oh yeah, that last film was good," but they haven't really got an interest in. They're not. In, they're not involved in science fiction in the way I was, which is actually going to conventions and, and meeting authors and so on. You know, it, it, it's very unusual for women to be so involved in it. 
Um, so I, I was, I'm viewing it as a woman, aren't I? I, I can see how, what's wrong with all this. Whereas yeah. a, a young man wouldn't, a young man wouldn't. They would, in the days before the internet, that would have been, consi they considered that as normal. You know, they were, a lot of them would have been looking at those comics because it was the only place they might see a half naked woman. Yeah, I think that was a very powerful point you made about you could smuggle in pornography into these comics yeah. and they are addressed at young boys and yeah. guess they're preparing them for a world of like, uh, uh, preparing them for power really, saying like, yeah. if you want to be a dominant sex class, this is, uh, you know, these are the tools. You have yeah. your your science or your degree and then you have your, attitude towards women and this makes this is part of your you know your you, sex class domination and you will okay. always be you will always be the one in control you yes. will always be the one in control by virtue of just being a man you're going to be the astronauts you're going to be the, the scientists you're going to be the the, the 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 computer geeks that create it all and that is actually what happened it's, it's only very recently that women started breaking into these fields so i've been way. i've been reading left hand of darkness and yeah. um ursula Le Quin has obviously a very famous uh feminist science fiction writer and i was really struck by left hand of darkness which is um people experimenting with changing well the, you know, it's like a precursor to the transgender movement in a way, but changing sex and experimenting with roles. Yeah. Um, and what was really interesting is that everyone celebrates the, this as a kind of, you know, as a, the vision of what came later. But if you actually read it, mm. her depiction of females in it, because there's a, there's a character in it and he's interacting with these beings that are changing... Um, yeah, I guess what they represent as male or female. And what's interesting is that the language that is used to describe the females in the book are coquettish and, um, you know, uh, inferior. And so I was thinking, why would a female a feminist science fiction writer create male characters and then the male characters describe the female characters in the book as being inferior? It because didn't... at the time she was writing, this stereotype was pervasive through the entire genre. Publishers might even have insisted on it, you see. She might have had another idea of how she wanted to, um, dis to describe those characters, and maybe the publisher thought, oh, throw in this, throw in that, you know. We, we don't know at this, uh, I wouldn't, we, we don't know from this length of time, you know, looking back, but, you know, when she was writing those books, the stereotyping was right the way throughout the industry. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, some women um, had to write using, um, you know, their initials, pseudonyms, you know, to, to try and break into science fiction. Because when they sent the manuscripts off to a publisher, it wouldn't even be accepted if there was a female name on it. You know, so I, I, I don't blame her. I, I think maybe she was like trapped in the sort of um, the, the stereotyping that, that was around at the time, you know. Um, yeah, well, there's certainly a lot. I was surprised by how much was in it, yeah, considering yeah. it was meant to be. And um, she also, we probably haven't got time to, to go into uh, Ursula Le Quinn here, but she did have some interesting ideas about science fiction being a pack of lies in one of the, um, the introductions to one of it, actually the left hand of darkness. She said, what I tell is lies. Um, but I'm invited to all these conferences uh, to talk about the future. Mm. So I guess, I mean, where do you see the pack of lies in science fiction as being? Where's the pack of lies? Because you're kind of implying that what's fantasized about in science fiction sometimes turn, turns into reality, but you can't mean that, right? Because I think that, I think that if you, to, uh, there, there's a lot of really, um, science fiction, which is still considered quite out there, quite outrageous. Um, Stephen Baxter is a British writer. He's actually my favourite living science fiction author. And he has written extensively about future human societies, whether they're on space colonies or on spaceships or on other planets, um, which as soon as humans get away from Earth, we're going to start evolving really fast. Um, 
whether it's in a mechanized way or not. And so he's envisaging societies where human beings are like bees, you know, hive societies they're called, uh, where the female women, the phenomes, you know, that, that we actually live like sort of so, social inst insects on other planets. And there's hardly any men, whatever men are there are just kept around for the sperm, you know? And so some, there's some, some really out there science fiction around. And my attitude to that is that none of it is lies. Whatever people, whatever men think of, some man eventually will try and try and, uh, you know, try and build or, or create. And um, I think science fiction has been, that's why I've used the word grooming. It's, it's uh, because when, when these things, things eventually do happen, nobody bats an eyelid. You know, yeah. nobody bats an eyelid at things like uh, athletes running on artificial legs or, um, you know, little children being given implants so they can see and hear again. Whereas, you know, a few years ago, you know, that people would say that's science fiction. Um, well, I think you should come back after I publish my book because I have a counter argument to this, but I'm not going to go into it now. And I'd love to know what your opinion of it, but let's just part that to one side for a minute yeah, about whether it's lies or not, whether they're, whether things that go on. I mean, I, I actually think largely they're just, what they're actually telling us is, um, how much pornography they watch. So yeah. interestingly, Nex Machina, you know, you've mm -hmm. got this situation where you've got a robot that's locked in a cage. And mm -hmm. um, I've heard British, British science, not science fiction writers, British scientists in computer sciences saying it's a love story. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. what kind mm -hmm. of love story <clears throat> happens with a woman locked in a cage with half of her body missing, you know. Well, exactly. I mean, that's so, why I said it. I said it's the most disingenuous of all of those films. Yeah. Um, because it's trying to make out that it, only some mad eccentric would do this kind of thing. And you know from your own campaigning mm, and that's your own right. research that actually the whole idea of this is that it will eventually be available to all, everybody, um, all men. Uh, you know, that it'll be available to everybody. Um, and why would you need to do that unless you were going to do away for, with women as an actual part, second part of the human race? What do the men need robot yeah. sex robots for, you know? No, it, I, it, I definitely think there's a, a deep hatred of women that underlies these films and representations that you describe. Yeah. A yeah. deep and, disgust, and, yeah. hatred, as not, Sheila Jeffries would say. Um, of women, and I thought your alien analysis was powerful. Well, and, that, to um, is, that to me is why those films are so fascinating, why, why they're so famous, is because of the repulsive nature of the alien mother. Um, it, it's mm. having a go at everything. It's having a go at mothers, it's having a go at, at birth, it's having a go at reproduction, it's having a go, it's, it's saying all that stuff is so totally disgusting that we mm. have to send in a hit squad of a Marines Mm. Uh, with Ripley, the uh, um, you know the token woman who is really like a space cowboy anyway, you know, at their head to to to, to blow. Yeah, I thought it was funny people. that that you use that as an example because the only women who get given the roles as powerful in these films are one that act out the violence against yeah. the female. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the female versions yeah. of aliens or what robots. I called just space cowboys, yeah. So it, only the handmaidens, only the yeah. handmaidens get any kind of reward in these films. Yeah, um, yeah. I actually <laughs> I hope, watched. Uh, I hope oh, sorry, go on. I was saying I hope um, the the ones I've picked um, you found quite interesting. Amazing. Like, there could I, be I, loads more. Yeah, let's do another one of these with some different films because. I think your voice here is so important because you because um, you are an artist because you are a political cartoonist because you've had this unique experience. Uh, you've just got a richness of perspective that I think really, well, it just well, I have, you know, to, was say, I have to say to you, Kathleen, that when I've talked to women in in the radical feminist world, very few are in, interested in science fiction very few realize how much boys and men have grown up with this mm. and how before the internet came along it was this was this was what they did this was their recreation um comics and even now with the internet 
even well it's morphed into extreme porn hasn't it yeah video games 3d it, porn yeah. i'm going to be talking about 3d porn later it's morphed into it and i haven't gone into any of that because that's not my sphere i haven't gone into anime for example i haven't gone into um manga which all of this is um kind of it's still you know still very popular only mm -hmm. now a lot of it's on screen and not as like real life comics but like this is what it's morphed into but it's still carrying on all the same themes isn't it yeah so preparing us for this future and like um is it even the future kathleen are we yeah is it even the future it yeah it's already here a lot of it you know so i i'm going to start bringing it not because i've run out of things to talk about but because oh. the internet says don't make very, very long videos. Right. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll come back, we'll do another session at some point in the future because it's brilliant work. But I guess well, I, my I, last question to you oh, would be, yeah. what would radical feminist science fiction look like? Oh my goodness. I, I would hope that it wouldn't simply recreate the stereotypes the other way around. You know, I, I wouldn't want to read a book and, it, oh, this is a radical feminist book because the men are, you know, kept as sort of sex slaves and, and just used to harvest the sperm. I'm sorry, that's just literally turning it around and that wouldn't be radical feminism to me. I mean, I, I'm I'm in the Jermaine Greer school that it's, we, we're looking for liberation, not equality. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to read it, 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 something that was similarly violent, similarly horrible with men as the... Uh, Victims, you know. So, um, is there is there radical feminist science fiction out there? Um, obviously, you I did. Men I mentioned some of them: Joanna Russ and Sherry S. Pepper. A lot of they're very popular um, among women. Um, but even them, you you read them, and just like Ursula Le Guin, you can still see the stereotyping that they had to that they were living within, uh, which they couldn't help putting in their writing. Um, even though they might have been considered very uh, advanced for their time, you know. So if you so, yeah. could, if you could, <laughs> if you could imagine a future, mm -hmm. right, informed by your values, <laughs> that wasn't, you know, not like this porn, basically, this porn science that's being put in the world, porn computing, what would your vision be? I, I think a world where we are using our... Um, intelligence to design machines that will help us to farm the earth and to help us to feed the billion. I mean, the human population is estimated to top out at 10 billion. That's a hell of a lot of people, but it will top out at 10 billion. But in the meantime, we've got to figure out a way to feed them all. So we should be, um, We I would like to see a world where <laughs> people are inventing ways of um, cleaning up the pollution and, and feeding feeding um, all, all these, how can we think that we live in a world with all this advanced technology and science, and yet there are children starving all over the world and there are d diseases ravaging populations. Uh, you, know, we, you know, none of that has been, nothing's been cured. You know, we haven't, we haven't cured it, you know, the ills of the world. So that is obviously what I would prefer to see. Um, I, I don't say that, we shouldn't be looking at going out into space. We probably, it's probably part of our natural evolution to do that, but we should be looking at how we, um, humanity, we should be centering humanity, not working against humanity, which is what's happening at the moment. Well, that sounds like a very inspirational vision and one that I would subscribe to as well. Oh, yeah, thank you very too. much Stella it's been absolutely brilliant and uh, can I just say can I just say Catherine Kathleen I know this is on your channel but as regards to the um presentation if anybody looking uh, is looking at this after it goes up on YouTube and they want to just take screenshot of any of my slides and just use them for discussion or, or take them into their university and chat about it and, and use it as a start for a talking point they can feel free to do so you know well, I would hope that if any lecturers out there thinking about representations in film and media see this presentation, they may invite you in as a special guest lecturer uh, oh. to give your uh, perspective. Because, you know, this is, there are bits and pieces of this history, but it's, for example, last night I watched Wonder Woman. And, mm. you know, Wonder Woman, it sounds great. You know, she's a powerful figure. But the... The idea behind Wonder Woman was, uh, you know, the whip was BDSM. Oh, yeah. So, well, I mean, 
one of my slides is about Wonder Woman. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That yeah, you, a whole you, outfit is is about pornography. A, she's a Barbie doll. <laughs> she's a Barbie doll with with a few technological gadgets. That's it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's completely disrespectful in terms of, and even today, you know, the all the all the modern films, they're just pornographic representations over and over again. It's like women have to say, I'm not pornography. I don't mm. aspire to be pornography. And, you know, I am a human being already. Let's create this. Let's create another character to think about what can and can't be human. Well, this um, is why I feel Mad Max Fury Road stands out. It's an absolute standout film. It yeah. does show in it several different types of women. It's got women who are like the Earth Mothers who are kept there just for the milk, for the babies. It's got the young wives who are who are or were the sex slaves, but they've escaped. Mm. And it's got this the um, female lead who is like the hero who rescues everybody. And it's got these wonderful old ladies who ride motorbikes through the desert and and are looking to try and uh, bring back the, um, the, the the to to regreen the earth and bring back the, the seeds and the plants and you know. Wonderful, wonderful. It's full of wonderful female characters, and I would urge anybody to, to watch that film. Yeah, a brilliant yeah. film. Okay, <laughs> thanks ever so much, Stella. And uh, yeah, everybody watch Fury Road, it's brilliant. Yeah, and um, <laughs> if I can, there we go. Bye.